All right, good afternoon. So I'm Dom Dalbello. I uh, teach engineering at Allen Hancock College. Okay, so I didn't even know engineering existed at the community college when I was a graduate student. And one of my teaching, uh, one of my students said, my instructor at Santa Barbara City is going on sabbatical and they need someone to teach the engineering classes. And I'm like, there's engineering at community college? And so I uh, filled in part of his load for a year. And uh, eventually, uh, the teaching position at Allen Hancock College opened up, and um, I applied. And I was actually a part-timer at Allen Hancock for uh, fall. And then uh, they opened it up, a, a, a rare mid-year hire. And I've been there uh, since spring, full time, spring of 2013, spring of 2003, full time. <laughs> it seems like only yesterday. <laughs> OK, how do I use this thing? Okay, so what is community college? Okay, so uh, community colleges were founded in the local communities as an extension of the high schools. So many community colleges would start in the high school itself. They might have a handful of classes, but it's primarily to uh, allow students to not have to go away to college. Because in the day, college was even relatively more expensive than it is now. You'd have to go somewhere. You'd probably have to be very, pretty well off to go to college. So we want to enable students to stay at home, take college classes, and get something beyond a high school um, education. So the first community college was uh, founded in Illinois, start of the uh, 1900s. And the first California community college was Fresno Junior College, which is now Fresno City College. And I underline city because City or community is what really what we like to be called, okay? We're not a junior college. We're not little university. We are teaching the same level of classes at a university. So one of my students once asked me in our uh, engineering statics class, when are we going to do university level problems? And I'm like, we are doing university level problems. This is the same class that you would get at Cal Poly or UCSB. So you'll see very few, there are still a few that call themselves junior college, but it's mostly city or community college. What's our job? Okay, our job is very complex for what our resources uh, that we actually have. So one is to prepare students for transfer. Okay, so they take their first two years theoretically at the community college and then they transfer on. But we also are responsible for preparing students for the workforce get a degree, a two-year degree or certificate. Here's some skills. They can go out and get a job okay, with only, they don't need a bachelor's degree for those jobs. Okay? That's actually probably the biggest chunk of what we do. Um, adult education, non-credit. Okay, So non-credit can include um, some senior citizens who want to learn more about how to get onto the internet, right? Go to the community college and take a computer class. Or we have a big English as a second language program at Hancock, so those are non-credit courses too. And then finally, economic development, and sometimes that's called contract ed. Um, so a company needs to train their um, employees how to use Excel more effectively. They don't have anybody in-house. They don't have an in-house training program. They will go to a local community college and hire community college to come in and give classes either at the institution, at the uh, company itself, or at, they, they have a special class at the community college. We also, um, sort of a contract ed, uh, but they get credit. Uh, we teach classes at the prison in Long Park, so there's that as well. So usually community colleges are responsible for the um, prison um, uh, population's education. This is what we do. We change lives. Okay? Many of my students, their parents have worked in the fields all their lives. They're still working in the fields. Next fall, a whole bunch of my students will transfer to the university. They'll go on to earn engineering degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, PhD. That changes that student's life, that family's life, future generation's life, community. Okay? That's what Fundamentally, we do. 
least we hope that's what we're doing. 114 community colleges, maybe 115, we're on the cusp in the state of California in 72 districts, okay? So high school districts is what you are probably used to. How many have gone to community college? Okay, and so, you know, a lot of times we don't know what a community college is. It's that little school that no one wants to go to because they didn't get into, you know, they'd rather go to the university, okay? But as you see, we have, transfer opportunities. I'm going to show you the effect uh, on the next slide. 72 districts, so they're locally governed, even though we're under a bigger umbrella. Okay, our boss is really at Hancock, five elected officials, just like in a high school district, you elect every four years someone in your board of trustees. We have a board of trustees. Okay, but we're all trying, we're all under a big umbrella. There are 2.1 million students supposedly in the California uh, community college system, um, biggest educational institution system in the United States, if not the world, okay? So sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad because it takes a lot to get something to change and, and we're all doing different things, 72 districts, okay? So we're all sort of have, give the community the same experience, but we're all locally driven, so we can only offer lower division courses, okay? So the first two years of college, okay? So I have a course called Material Science, and generally that's not taught in the first two years at most schools in California. So some, of, some schools do give upper division credit for that, but that's usually rare, okay? So we can't intentionally offer upper division classes. Okay. Um, material science is a lower division class in many schools, so I can. We can only, we grant up to associate's degrees, two years degrees, two year degrees. These are local degrees, okay? You've taken a certain set of courses in your discipline, some general education. You have completed this course of work. Good stepping stone, okay? Recently, we've added uh, Associate degree for transfer. You basically complete a certain set of courses in a certain discipline, and with that package, you are guaranteed a spot somewhere in some CSU in some similar major. So that's one way, another way of transferring. Because if you imagine that um, if we are teaching courses that match what the CSUs and the UCs do, okay, we're gonna to have to, 114 community colleges are gonna to have to talk to 23 CSUs and nine C, uh, UCs and say, does our math calculus one match yours? Okay, and that's a lot of connections, okay? And so the ADTs are more like, here's a whole package. And the student has completed this package, will you accept them and give them two more years basically to complete? Um, some CCs can offer four-year degrees, but they can't overlap UCs and CCs. This is sort of new. Um, and so like Bakersfield offers advanced manufacturing. So there's not an advanced manufacturing degree anywhere in the UC or CSU system. And we can offer certificates. So those are basically like in uh, really hands-on programs. So welding, machining, um, certificates in business, where you've learned a specific set of skills and you can use them on the job um, immediately. Okay, so in terms of transfer, 29% of UC graduates started at a community college. That's what the uh, community college website says, so it must be true. 51% who go to CSU started at a CCC. So I don't know how they're counting that exactly. Maybe it's one course, but I think it's more than just one course. They must have had some preparation at the community college. 22% okay, of bachelor's degrees in STEM, community college. 20% of community college students go to CCC. And 25% of college-going students are somehow enrolled in a community college in California. Little demographics, okay. 
Um, so this is Allen Hancock College. We served in the last fall 13,000 students, individual students. Okay. Not all of them are full-time students. So we're interested in what's called the full-time equivalent student. So you basically take up all the units the students have taken and divide by like 15, and that's a full-time equivalent student. So we have about 9,500 full-time equivalent students and about 4,000 who actually go to school roughly roughly full-time. Okay. Um, our population is primarily Hispanic or Latinx, and uh, about half of that is white. So, and then we have a smattering of the other um, ethnicities. Uh, different community colleges will have uh, different ethnic mixes, okay, depending upon what the local population is, of course. Um, we are a very heavy agricultural area in Santa Maria, and our population is roughly uh, two-thirds Hispanic, Latinx in our local community. Um, and so we have a higher percentage than on average, we'll say. Um, the age distribution is there and the number of units. So this is really where, in general, we might have a difference in the student population um, in terms of their, um, I want to say their going to college um, background. Okay, so at, at a university, perhaps you're going to see a lot of students who are pretty much traditional, what we call traditional students. Okay, they're right out of high school, very young. Our uh, distribution is a little wider. Okay, you see there's like almost 30% are 30 or older. Okay, when I started teaching, about four of my students were older than me. Okay, and I started teaching relatively late in, in uh, community college instructor's life. Another is the number of units, okay? Full-time load is about 12 units. That's what we have for full-time. That's what we consider full-time. And you see there's only 1,000 who are taking 15 units or less or more, okay? So a lot of them are part-time. And if it's a two-year degree and you're going part-time, it's going to be a three-, four-year degree perhaps, okay? And they take it because there's a part-time load because even though community college is relatively inexpensive, there's usually a lot of other responsibilities that they have. Either they're working, helping their family, they're re returning students, they already have a family, single parents. Um, they have a lot of other issues going on in their life, okay? Um, so that's not saying that um, they're not capable or anything, or they, they could have gone to university straight out, okay? But maybe one reason or another, they didn't go to university. They're coming back, changing careers, doing something. Okay, so there's a lot of, uh, the other thing I want to say is that there's a lot of um, first generation students. Okay, class. So uh, that 62% Hispanic, Latinx um, statistic. In the state of California, how many people have a bachelor's degree or greater in the state of California? Do you know what percent? Want to guess? It's the quiz. 40? It's about 30, 33 in there. Okay. In Santa Barbara County, it's about 30, a little more than 30. Hispanic, Latinx population, it's less than 10%. Okay. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of growth that we can uh, achieve. All right, did I skip a one? All right, so here's the opportunities that we have in terms of teaching. Full-time tenure track, basically a 10-month contract. Okay, so basically I have June and July off. Okay, right, the perfect schedule, right? Okay, well, that's when you do all your prep work and do your lab, your uh, lab manuals, rewrites and stuff. Um, there's part-time, which is a term contract, okay, by semester or by quarter. So that's another issue when students transition from community college. 111 are on the semester system. We transfer to UC, all but one is quarter system. Okay, so there's gonna be a transition that they're gonna have to overcome. Okay, 
have to deal with. Um, there are three community colleges that are on the quarter system. Uh, Part-timers can teach up to about two-thirds of a load, and we'll get to the load in a moment. Okay? So two-thirds of a load. So you'll see a lot of, and two-thirds of a load is not enough to buy a house on in California. Okay? So you're going to see a lot of, um, or you'll see many who are teaching at more than one community college, okay? which is a lot easier in the LA area, San Diego area, Bay area, not so easy in this central coast, right? I'm an hour away. And then you might have full-time temporary positions, which are fairly rare. Okay, there's something has happened to a full-time faculty member. We need to fill their spot. Uh, we have a retirement. We're really not sure that we are going to get a good pool to replace them. So we're going to hire a temporary person. Um, we might have a sudden growth in a certain area that we can't cover with the faculty we have. We'll hire a full-time temp. So if you have a, get a full-time temp job, that's going to be pretty good because someone else will look at it and say, some other community colleges has had enough faith in this person to hire them full-time, and they have experience in full-time, and they still want to do it. Okay? Um, note at community colleges, counselors, librarians, the school nurse, um, they're considered faculty. Okay? So... Counseling, academic counseling, so planning students' academic path is a faculty member. An articulation officer is the one who says, yes, ME 14 at UCSB counts as engineering 152 at Allen Hancock College. They're the one who helps make sure that we're matching uh, curriculum across institutions. Some other things that you can do. Department chair. Um, represents the department, uh, provides leadership, deals with student issues they have with faculty, deals with faculty issues that they have with other faculty or with students or the administration. Um, you have responsibility. They call me boss or jefe at, at school, but I'm really not their boss. I'm not their supervisor. So I'm more of Somewhat coach maybe encourage student or encourage faculty. You really should be doing this, um, but I can't say you're fired. Okay. Um, so I, I like to say it's more facilitating. Uh, you could be a coordinator of a project, which might or a coordinator of a certain set of classes. So um, so say we have a fairly big biology department in our campus. It would be pretty nice if we had a biology coordinator, someone who was just responsible for the biology classes within the life and physical science department. We don't, but that could be a possible position. Be a grant or project director. Okay, so even though we don't do research, we do get grants. They could be related to research or uh, scholarships, mentoring programs. Um, so I'm involved with uh, four uh, just this week, five, um, grants, either with the National Science Foundation or with other entities. Um, so I really should be doing that instead of talking here. Uh, reassign time for special projects and a coach. So coach is also can be faculty members. Um, usually they're hired in the kinesiology department or physical education department, and we were looking for a coach for the baseball team. Okay, and but they also will be teaching physical education classes, kinesiology classes, stuff like that. Okay. Here's our load. I say anomaly because this is our contract and this is sort of roughly how it should be distributed theoretically somehow. 15 lecture hours, okay? 15 hours in the classroom. Labs generally count less. So if all you're doing is teaching a lab, it might be, depending on the, upon the contract at the community college, it might be 17, might be 20. Okay. Might even be the same. Depends on the contract that the institution has made with the faculty association, the union. Um, various courses have various hours. So if you are teaching psychology, 
Most of those classes are three unit classes. If you're teaching all three unit classes, I think that's five classes. But if you're teaching Algebra 2, five hours in the classroom, that's three classes. Okay, so it depends. 15 prep hours, okay? So either prepping for the class and it includes grading, okay? So the disadvantage is there's no TAs, right? So a lot of you are TAs, right? The professor's really happy because they don't really have to grade everything. They give it to the TA. Now we have your great job at a community college and there's no one to really pass it off onto, okay? So you might have to be creative in how you do the grading and make sure students are making progress and providing them the most important thing, which is feedback to improve. Five hours are required of office hours. So I need to be in my office or somewhere for five hours a week. Okay? We can do some of it online. And it's probably a good idea to define, especially for newer students, students that don't have college experience, what office hours mean. Because a couple of my students in the past thought those office hours were, that I listed on my syllabus were when I'm going to be in my office and I didn't want to be disturbed. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, come to get help then. Okay. And two hours of campus service, which would be committee work, perhaps, outreach. And these are some of the other main things that you need to do. Note, there's no research on there. Okay? But that doesn't prohibit you from doing research or working on other projects. Outreach. So this is one of our outreach events. This is Friday Night Science. So next Friday night, actually, at Allen Hancock College, we have Friday Night Science where we deck out a bunch of the science classrooms. There's displays all around. Our science students are out there doing hands-on presentations. Uh, and the community comes. We usually get about 1,500 community members. And here the chemists are doing what chemists do. They <laughs> blow things up. Okay, so that's really fun. So next Friday night, there's my plug. Why do it? Why is this page 67? That's crazy. You put them all together. Okay. All right. So now you know a little bit about what we do. So how do you get in there? The minimum quals or MQs are a master's degree in the discipline. That is statewide. Okay. Not a PhD, just a master's degree in the discipline or equivalent. Okay. Now, the state realizes that not, you know, a history class doesn't have to be taught by someone with a master's in history. There can be other venues or other ways to get to that equivalency. And they have already listed, you can have a BA in history plus an MA in poli-sci, humanities, area studies, women's studies, social science, ethnic studies. Okay. And then there might be other options allowed by the district that are, say, not covered by the state, but the district locally feels, oh, that would be a fit. Okay? But you want to be careful, right? So I know Jens, who taught last year, you know, he, he taught chemistry. Um, he has a chemistry degree, but where does biochemistry fit? There is no biochemistry classes in um, community college. If you have a degree in biochemistry, do you, are you legitimately able to teach chemistry? Okay, so that's going to be probably a local decision by the district. Okay. You could have equivalency, which means you, uh, the experience that, it, um, that you have educationally, work-wise, is equivalent to what a master's degree in the discipline would be. Okay. So for example, if you are, have a chemical engineering background, and you want to teach chemistry, okay, the school is going to have to look, yeah, these courses that you have taken, five minutes, thank you, <laughs> but I'm the last one. There's no end time, right? <laughs> the courses that you have taken are equivalent to a master's in chemistry, and then they'll say, yes, you could teach the chemistry classes. But that can be dangerous because then you open it up to all chemistry classes, not just a particular set. So... For example, uh, statistics, okay? You can get a master's degree in math without taking any statistics classes in some places. So, and then right next door, economics, they're using stats, okay? So at our school, 
we have allowed economists to be placed on the disciplines list of statistics. They can teach statistics, which is a math class, but they uh, can't teach you the other math classes. And so that's another way to do that. So you might want to also you know, look at that. Okay. So how do you get a position at CC? Best way to get a teaching position is get teaching experience, as we said, instructor of record earlier today, okay, especially at a community college. Well, how do you get that, right? It's like, how do I get a job? I got to get a job beforehand. So the kind of jobs that you can get that are low uh, risk for the institution, low risk for yourselves, or what are called part-time jobs or adjunct positions. So Hancock has 14 full-time math people right now, and we have about 25 part-timers. They teach about 50-50 that's the distribution of the classes, roughly. A little more on the part on the full-timer side, but they're teaching an overload. So I think about half the classes are taught by part-timers are overload. Okay. And as I sort of hinted at before, especially if you live where community colleges are close to one another, you have you probably are going to want to teach at several community colleges because. Um, Right now, you're in graduate school. You probably want to go to Santa Barbara City, Ventura, Oxnard, Allen Hancock. Those might be good while you're in school. But if you're sort of graduated, have done something, and you're just working, okay, you might want to look at doing several, um, working at several community colleges to make ends meet. Okay. So get in the pool. Okay. How do you get in the pool? Look at a community college's website, okay? Usually they're advertising either for a particular position or they're advertising for a pool. So a pool means you send in your application and it's gonna sit there in human resources. Department chair might go over there if they need someone soon and look at it. It might never be looked at, okay? But if you're not in the pool, you're not gonna get officially talked to. Another thing is, even if you send in your application, contact, probably email, the department chair. Okay? I'm not very good at answering my phone. Okay? There's a lot of other things to do. So email the department chair, the department that you might be interested in teaching at, and get your name in there. The department chair makes the schedule. They're the ones that know, oh, I have unstaffed classes. They're going to be the ones who are going to be looking for part-timers to fill those classes. Okay, your name is going to be right on their front of their uh, front of their eyes when you email them. Okay, we generally continuously accept applications, so even if there's not a pool being advertised, there's no reason to not submit. Okay, and um, or and contact the department chair. Okay, probably the best way to make sure that if they if they're looking at uh, hiring soon. Um, the part-time pool, the part-timers, it's a weird mix. There can be retired high school or retired faculty who are still doing part-time work. There could be uh, people who are sort of taking a break from full-time work and teaching. Might be young graduate students who have, are still in school or about ready. So depending upon what the individual mix is, we might have a high turnover in part-timers or it might be a long turnover in part-timers. So, Full-time hiring, usually you'll see an announcement in December or April timeframe, through that timeframe. Um, you can visit the college website. Lisa measured, man mentioned cccregistry.org before. Okay, that is basically the clearinghouse of all um, community college um, jobs. They will uh, host job fairs in January, either in LA or one in LA and one in the Bay Area. So that's a good place to go. All of the community colleges, at least in those regions, are going to be there saying, we have these openings that we think are coming up. There's also going to be um, uh, workshops and talks like how to write a good statement, things like that. Our 
I asked my uh, HR, where do they advertise? And they sent me this email that had more than what's up there. Okay, So you can look at higheredjobs.com, blank in higheredjobs.com. There was a big list and monster. They even advertised on Craigslist. So here's the hiring process, both full-time and part-time. Application, probably should put a cover letter. Make sure you change the name of the institution that you are applying to. The application form, okay? Little background about yourself, your degrees, references, uh, academic and non-academic career experience, your resume or CV. Okay? Unofficial transcripts. In our institution, at least the part-timers need to submit a diversity statement because we're very much about equity, very much about helping students of all, you know, from all walks of life, all ethnicities, all backgrounds to succeed. Um, sometimes a teaching philosophy statement, okay? And that's for sure gonna be in your full time. And then letters of recommendation. Now, we don't require them for part-timers. Most community colleges won't. And even our full-time application, at least at Hancock, doesn't require references. We're gonna go check them after, right? going to ask somebody to write a letter of ref, uh, recommendation for you that's going to be not good? Probably not. Okay. Um, typically, we get at least 30 to 60 in a, in a pool for full-timers. Uh, I've heard up to over 120 for one position, um, but typically 50, one position is going to be how many we get. So you really want to stand out. You really want to emphasize your teaching, okay? Not that you did all this research, because we're a community college. We want to know why you're passionate about teaching. Okay? So the diversity statement is going to be important. The teaching philosophy will be important. Uh, if you're a part-timer, you're probably going to have an interview with either the department chair, which might be as simple, depending upon the school, Here's our textbook, here's the syllabi, good luck. Or at least in the math department at Hancock, we actually have a little committee that gets together and we ask you to do a teaching demo for us. Full time is a bit more. We usually have a uh, hour, roughly three quarter to an hour long uh, interview with faculty, dean, a student and staff. There's probably gonna be a teaching demo um, some community colleges do that teaching demo within the interview. Um, but at Hancock, we like to, you know, have students. We're going to set up a student class and we're going to say, this is the class that you are teaching. We want you to do 20 minutes on this particular topic. And so, so it focuses them on one topic, but allows them to be, to show their stuff. Okay, how they do things. And really, we want to see how they interact with the class. Okay, so obviously, we'll want them to do it right, but what's important is interacting with the class. Um, and there might be a writing exercise. So I had to write a letter of recommendation as my writing exercise for Hancock. We usually don't do that because it usually is not a big, right? You should be able to write, um, but there might be other things they ask you to do as part of the process. If you make it past this, usually we invite about 10 to 12 people for one position to interview with us. If you make it past this, we send forward about three, student, three students, three candidates to the second interview, which is with the president, vice president of instruction, the dean, and the interview committee chair, who is a faculty member. And so you have another hour-long interview with them. Okay. Because the person who hires you is the president, not the faculty in your department. So when we send three people forward, we have to be happy with whoever we send forward. And then intake, nuts and bolts. Got to send in your official transcripts so we know where you, you, you're legit. We know where to put you on the hiring scale. Uh, you're going to have college orientation. You need to have a TB test or verification at community college, and you need fingerprinting because we do a Department of Justice check. And there's one minute left. <laughs> so what are we looking for? First, master's in whatever, usually, or equivalent. This is from the um, application for math that 
closed a, little, a few weeks ago, and they're in the process of going through the applications now. Second, evidence of sensitivity, understanding of diverse backgrounds. Third, experience and enthusiasm for teaching. Okay, this is in here, not that you have to read it all, but as I was, it's like communicate, be a team member, um, work with others, play nice, okay? We're looking for people who are going to be, as someone said, a good fit, okay? And that's hard to, you know, you don't know if you're a good fit until you go there and really experience stuff. But we're trying to make, um, you know, trying to, to choose the right person because we're making an investment in them, okay? So this is what we're really looking forward for, teaching experience as an instructor of record, especially at community college, regardless of what degree you have, okay? So... Again, if you have your PhD and you have a lot of research, you want to emphasize how that is going to help you teach at a community college. Okay? Because we don't care how many publications you have, if you can't get students to learn and help them get better, you're not going to be very successful. Okay? And you know, we want to make sure you're the right fit. Okay? If you don't present yourself as the right fit, you know, it's not going to happen. Passion for student success. Be flexible with the teaching schedule. I'm teaching Tuesday, Thursday nights, 6 to 7.20 this semester. I'll be teaching night classes, again, because students go part-time, students have jobs. We need to meet the students where they're at. Be a team player, be innovative and willing to learn, and be yourself. Be yourself in the interview, be yourself as an employee. Just the tenure process. We are tenured. Okay. Generally a four-year process. No research portfolio. Doesn't matter if I bring in zero dollars or two million. It's about teaching. And so that is where the student evaluations are going to come in. And our team, our, we evaluate non-tenured faculty every two semesters. The dean, two tenured faculty are on the team. And we look at student evaluations and colleague feedback. Okay. Are you a good teacher? Are you fitting in well? Okay. That is our primary purpose. And I went longer than one minute, but <laughs> I'm going to use my TA um, brownie points from before. <laughs> so let's give a round of applause for Don. has to leave we totally understand but if you can stay and ask questions we're uh, dom is here to answer them so i mean professor dabalo who's got a question how do you balance teaching students have who have such a wide range of preparation levels that is a challenge, and it's more and more of a challenge with some recent legislation where we cannot place any student, force them to take a what's called a um, developmental math class or remedial math class. So um, the experience is wide in any given class. Um, I'm fortunate because I'm teaching engineering classes. There's already some preparation that they've had and uh, but you got to meet students where they're at and we have a lot of support at, uh, systems in place we have a math center we have a writing center we have a stem center where they can go get tutoring and extra help uh, we have we're having support classes in addition to the classes that they can take right away um, so we have several different mechanisms we have workshops Really, the students are good students. They want to learn. They want to get somewhere. And primarily, it's managing their time, right? It's learning how to be a student. And sometimes that's very hard for faculty, all faculty, community college faculty, because they probably were good students when they went to school, and they know what needs to be done. So it's really meeting the students where they're at, trying to help them organize their time so that they can be as successful as possible. Is that good? It's, it's, that is the, yeah, crux of it. Jenny. Um, so 
I'm interested in like the mentorship side uh -huh. of of teaching at a community college, like especially at like an R1, you have graduate students, right? As if you're tenure track, you eventually have graduate students, um, which is exciting. That's what I like to think about as exciting, working with students in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but at community college, you don't have, as a teacher or professor, sorry, you don't have necessarily graduate students working on projects with you or just, okay, so that's a period. But I'm wondering how like mentorship looks like from teaching to students at, at a community college if you don't have that graduate student model. Right. Well, so we have those five hours of office right. hours, which right. is very powerful for students who actually do Absolutely. take advantage of that. Yeah. And so um, we see our students quite a bit. And yeah. we know those who, the, the, the challenging part is getting them connected. And uh, there are programs, support programs there that we have, EOP, Extended Opportunities Programs, the TRIO CAN. Those are there to help students get connected into the system and learn how to navigate the system. Um, I have two um, scholarship mentorship grants that allow me to do some other things. We have uh, the STEM Center, the MESA Center, where we have and we have volunteers who, from the community who come in and help the students. But yeah, the men that's a big thing, mentoring and helping students to see that, especially if they're on a transfer track, right. you know, I, I can't, we're not doing research, okay? We have to go somewhere. They still have two steps to go to get a job, keeping that external motivation. So we try to reach out to students. So, but that's very faculty personality driven too. Thank you. Good. Um, I guess, what is the average class size at Hancock? And the average class size kind of right like now is about 26. Okay. Would okay. you say that's pretty normative for CC? It's pretty normative. Usually we are um, about 35, we're capped at 35 most classes but there are big lecture classes. And so some, you know, some colleges have a, if your class is over X students, you're gonna get a little bump in your pay. Um, but usually a good class size is about, typical class size is about 30. Mm -hmm. Our average is 26 right now, I think. What's a large class? Uh, they're in the hundreds, so astronomy is uh, about 99. That's our lecture size. So uh, some schools could have a bigger class, but then your grading is going to be very different, okay? So, right, you're not going to be doing a lot of essays, essays okay? <laughs> so, exactly. Um, so what would you say is the biggest difference between teaching at, for example, UCSB and a community college? Because I guess most of our teaching experience we gain here. Um, so I'm just wondering. Content? None. If it's a transfer level class, there better be no difference. It is that the fact that most students are part-time and there's other things in their lives that are affecting their ability to get something done, right? So here, you've got to be full-time at a university, typically, unless you have some exception, okay, which is fairly rare. So you know this is their job at is, your job is to be a student at a university. And at a community college, because students have real life to deal with in many cases, or they think they do, they think they can work more, um, they don't always focus on being a student. And it's this transition which makes teaching at community college rewarding because you're getting sort of, you know, a transition between being a high school student, adolescent, to hopefully something a little more mature. And that's one of the things that makes things exciting. Does that make some sense? It's so kind of building off that and Elizabeth's earlier question, do you or other professors that you know kind of take more of a mastery approach to learning where you're giving the students multiple opportunities to master particular 
aspects of the course, or do you, would you say that, no, you just kind of set out the bars, and if they don't succeed, they'll take it again next semester? Um, I think there's both, okay? So one of the big differences to me is in the grading. So like um, when students go on to transfer, they usually are graded on a scale, right? And someone's going to get an A, someone's going to get an F, and there's going to be a bunch of people in the middle. But um, I had one of my professors actually at UCSB, he says, my job is to make sure you master the material and you have to reach this level and this level and such. And so it's very, in a way, it's the grading system that they're used to, like 90, 80, 70. So that's what I, my syllabus says, 90, 80, 70. We can only give A, B, Cs, no plus or minuses. Um, but, um, you know, it's really not 90 because I grade hard. It's really 87, 85. But, yeah, we sort of have a lot of, I like to give a lot of opportunity. So homework every week. Um, three exams during the semester, a bunch of quizzes, and the final. So there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of low stakes, a lot of opportunity for me to give them feedback. Um, others might say, I'm not going to collect homework. I'm going to give you a couple exams, and that's it. So it's, you know, we really don't have, there's no requirement on how you do it necessarily. But, um, you know, we're trying to, help people grow. Um, I just have a follow-up question. So when you're talking about actually seeing students as people rather than maybe how the UC views students, do you feel like, <laughs> well, do you feel like you have support um, from the admin side and like, do you feel like faculty are supported at CCs to mm -hmm. kind of make adjustments mm -hmm. for students who have real life things going on, whether that's financial hardship, yeah. someone passing, et yeah. cetera? So we have a pretty strong student services side yeah. of the house and they are big advocates for students. And of course, there's a criteria that people have to meet to pass the class, mm -hmm. but they're always there reminding us that, hey, here is a student that has this special issue, um, the learning, uh, our learning assistance program, which is what DS, is it disabled? DS here, um, yeah, they are in communication. They're faculty members, the counselors. Um, so we really, if students need more time on exams, that's mm -hmm. you know a given. Um, it's um, yeah, we're there to get students to the next level. I think that helps us as a faculty as well as the students because, you know, students who are here, they're here. And students who are trying to get somewhere, there's a little different motivation, that they, little factors that they have. Does that answer? Yeah. Uh, so kind of a flip, <coughs> sorry, a flip side to that question. Uh, what sort of support is given to adjunct and part-time faculty members, uh, particularly those who either want to go on to a full-time mm -hmm. tenure-track position or who are juggling five different community colleges at once in order to pay their health insurance and make ends meet? Um, so what sort of support is given to faculty members like that? So in terms of what do you... Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like what uh, mentorship opportunities or... Uh, so generally for, we have... Uh, uh, Full-timers are always willing to help faculty members out. You just ask. Each of our math classes has a lead faculty. If you have a question about that, talk to the class, talk to lead faculty. If you're teaching developmental math, we have a developmental lead general question. If you have any question, come talk to me. Um, so usually it varies by department because the department is really the ones in touch with the part-timers. So. There might be, we have department orientations at the beginning of each semester. We reach out, say, we're changing the textbook. We're going to, here's some workshops we're going to use to help the transition. Um, really, we want to, you know, there's two ways to go about, um, two extremes. You could say, here's how we're going to teach the class. This is what you need to do. Or, here are the outcomes that we want you to meet. And 
here are some examples of how others are doing it and work on the class. Is that? Yeah. We have professional development opportunities. Everyone can attend professional development um, workshops, how to be a better teacher, different learning styles, different things that uh, all faculty, all staff can get to. So how do you balance um, creating an inclusive, kind of nurturing environment at the CC level, but at the same time hold them to like a high, like rigorous standard? Um, I think, you know, tutoring at um, the CC, I think there was just some adjustment. You know, you're, if you're trained at the UC level, mm -hmm. you know, I was expecting something and then seeing something else. Right. And so... You know, how do you adjust or how do you balance that? Because because the content is supposed to be, right, still rigorous and to set them up for success. Right. That is, you got to really listen. Okay. So one of the someone asked, what are some rookie mistakes in the interview earlier in the in the panel? Some rookie mistakes as a faculty member are coming in and being too energetic, too gung-ho, we're going to do this and this, and then the students can't get up to there for one reason or another. They don't have the time. They, don't have, they have other things going on. Um, um, so that's a big thing. Don't you know, bring out all the difficult stuff right away. Figure out where the students are. So that means listening to where they're at and being encouraging, being... Um, come to my office hours. Work with other students. A lot of students don't like to work with other students. Like, you've got to work with teams, um, but they feel like sort of was hinted earlier that they're afraid that they're going to look bad. Um, a lot of it is individual outreach and meeting the students where they're at. And sometimes that's hard because you don't have all that time. Or the students don't want to come in. I don't know if that answers your question. That's, that is one of the challenges is reaching people and can only provide so much opportunity with the resources we have. And hopefully they'll take advantage of that before they fail too many times. Is that... Well, in my book, the eight people who are left are hired. <laughs> Dedicated people. I'm just lobbying for them here. So, so what do you guys want to, what, what's your disciplines? Chemistry and passion. All right. How's that going? Okay. Good. So you know Jens. I do know Jens. Okay. Good. Anthropology. Anthropology. Anthro. All right. Cool. Jenny, you got Physics? Okay, I saw you roll your eyes when I said physics research. But <laughs> So, Friday Night Science, next Friday. Sociology. So, sociology. sociology, okay. Uh, marine science. Marine science, so biology. It's going to be, it's gonna be on the biology, yeah, environment. Math, yeah. Okay, so those are all important. The sciencey ones, especially, are important. They're going to be, there's not a lot of science majors, STEM majors, who are looking to teach necessarily at community college. And so we're looking for ones who are really good. We're able to motivate students to go on to BS degrees, master's degrees, or higher. Um, so right now, right, STEM is still in. And um, so those are good. Um, we're looking for good physics adjuncts, good um, Math adjuncts, okay, at least that's where my bailiwick is, so, okay. The anthropology instructor just became department chair. So there might be anthropology <laughs> positions, some classes, okay. We really appreciate you being so generous with your time and your wisdom. So yeah. one more round of applause and thank you all for Thanks. staying.